That's great, Glenn. Welcome to the written word. Thank you very much for doing this. Good to see you, Arkady. Are you well? I'm good. I'm good. I'm very good. I'm keep, trying to keep busy in, in lockdown, but sure. Okay, lock, lockdown 3.0. Yeah, fun. Fun, fun, <laughs> fun. So tell us this. Uh, what are you reading or what are you listening to? Are you are you an Audible guy? Are you a podcast guy? Are you... Um, do you like just a, a solid book in your hand? What's your what's your thing? I read about this yesterday, actually, the whole sort of concept of the podcast. I, I want to get into them, but the problem is I, I get distracted too easily. Do you know what I mean? Like, I mean, in my he's like, oh, I'll go run them when I'm doing pod. I trip over something. Do you know what I mean? And then, or sometimes I'll stick them on. I know what I'll do. I'll go to bed early, half an hour. I'll stick the earphones in. I'm clean out. Yeah. So I then have to go back and listen to it all over again. It's so... I, I love the concept of a podcast and I love the idea. So there was one called the Two Shot Podcast. Um, okay. Craig Parkinson, um, an actor who was in the original, he was Dot in Line of Duty. Oh, yes. And loved it. I loved it. To be fair, I would listen to his quite a lot. And then Colin Murray did one as well. So there, I've just lied to you. So I do do a bit of podcasts. Yeah. But it's almost like I have to go, right, I'm not doing anything for the next hour. I'm just yeah. going to sit and listen to this. Do you know what I mean? Um, in terms of the, the the written word, it's a funny one. Like, I don't know if it's the same for you. If I if you're if you're writing a piece, can you be reading a piece at the same time? So if I'm yeah, go ahead. yeah, I, I would. I'm very much. Um, if I'm writing something, I can't. I have to have finished off what I wanted to read and then concentrate on it. Uh, and nine times out of ten, I'll have probably picked up two or three different books and forgot which one I'm reading and and. And then we not read for six months, and then have four or five months where doing nothing but read. So it, it all varies. Like, you know, I suppose for your job, you're constantly reading. <laughs> I'd like to say I was constantly reading and picking up scripts all the time. Like, never fucking stops. Um, no, but it, it, there is an element of truth in that. So if, if I'm working on a project or I'm, or I'm setting up for a tape or a meeting, or I, I find it very difficult. Like, I, I'm in awe of those actors that, you know, whenever they're sitting in their trailer, yeah. they're reading books like there's no tomorrow I just I can't do that I, I, I don't know if it's something about <laughs> something about me but for me books were when you're on your holidays yeah you know what I mean you can lie to the pool and you can bring a couple of books with you and you and sit and, and and sort of mill through them then but if if I'm working on a project no I, I can't really um do you, do you have to have your head in the project and nothing else and that's yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, it depends on, on how sort of busy you are on the project. But like, if it's if it's four weeks rehearsal for a play, yeah. No, I'm not picking up a book. There's yeah. there's no chance, you know. Um, but the question was, what are you reading at the minute? Um, so if I'm a bit like you as well, you know. So you pick up and you start, and then you, you get distracted, and then you go back to it. Um, but there's a, a book called I Am Pilgrim. Okay. Have you heard of it? No, no. You need. I'm I'm going to tell you now. Going back. Okay, I am Pilgrim. I am Pilgrim. Who's it by? Hold on. Um, Terry Hayes. I am Pilgrim. So it's about, I think 2013, 2014 it came out. I only picked it up last year, till end of 2019. Um, and when you're reading it, you're like, this is a, somebody's going to make us in the film. Yes. This, this has to be a real page turner. Like I couldn't put it down. And then you go in and you try and find out who Terry Hayes is and you realize he's a film writer. Uh, oh, Mad Max is one of his, and you go. Well, that's why. That's why I connected with that because each scene is like a scene you'd see in a film. Yeah. So it's short, it's snappy, it's concise, and then there's a hook that throws you right into the next one and a curveball, and you're like, I need to know what happens next. So seven pound fifty, Waterstones. Order yeah. it now, right? <laughs> and and I should be getting. I should be on commission here. And if you don't like it, I'll give you your seven pound fifty back. I'm that um, confident you'll love it. That's a deal. That's definitely a deal. So congratulations on you. You're in uh, on screen at the minute with both uh, Marcella and Carnation Street. What, what what a way to start the year, end the year. Um, massive. Yeah, thanks. Um, it's a weird one, Mick. We started shooting. See, now you say Mar. What did you say, Mar? Well, I wasn't sure. Is it Marcella or Marcella? I I'm going Marcella. Marcella sounds better, I think. Listen, I'm, you know, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, everybody has their, you know, anyway, what, 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 what happens, in this season, happens, anyway. If you put an R in front of it, you know that you'd say, you know, R Michael or R Glenn, what sounds better? R Marcella or R Marcella? 
or Marcella, I'm going with Marcella. Yeah. Um, well, obviously, obviously, I had the same conversation with me agent before I had the audition. So is it, is it Marcella or Marcella? Um, yeah, we started shooting that April, March, April 2019. Wow. So that's, okay. that's, do you know what I mean? Yeah, and yeah. That's the nature of the job that we do. So, you know, it, it came out. I think step one came out on the Tuesday night and I started TX and on Corey on the Friday night. And of wow. course you start getting all these messages. Oh, you're on fire. You haven't stopped. And I'm like, I haven't actually done anything in between the two jobs, but you know, as, as long as you think that, you know, yeah. um, I, Marcella was a cracker to be fair. I, I watched the first two seasons as a, as a punter. Yeah. And I loved it. I, I thought it was a crack and show. And then obviously you get the, the call through to say, you know, there's a meeting. Do you want to go up for it? And I'm like, hands down. Yep. No bother at all. Um, so, but I say it was, it, it's that long ago. Um, I don't know if, have you seen it yet? I, I've watched, I, I didn't watch the first two seasons, but I heard you could just watch the third one. So I didn't know the A player thing and watched it in like a day. Um, right. Just been just season, just season three. Yep. Right, okay. So I'm going to say go back and watch season one and season two. Okay. Uh, yeah, season three, you're right, is standalone and you don't have to. Yeah. However, there was a through line from as a writer, because yeah. obviously we know each other in a different life. Yeah, yeah. But totally. now, now as the writer, there's a there's a through line from season one to season two, yeah. where when it happened on screen, I was like, oh, that, it's like, it's like Back to the Future 1. Right, okay. He okay. knew what was happening in Back to the Future 3. Yeah, yes. He was just dropping these little things in. But there's one, because I don't know whether, I mean, you don't need to know it. And on that, spoiler alert, right? But obviously she's, Marcella's dead in season three, which is yeah. which allows her to become Kira. Yeah. The, the undercover. Yep. But it's how she gets to being dead. It's it's literally the last scene in, in season two. But that was set up. In season oh, one, yeah, from the get -go. And you're like, love it. Um, so yeah, so the fact to say that it was it was being shot and based in Belfast. Oh yes, sorry. My question was, have you seen it? So there was the the storyline with the the bodies, the immigrants, and yeah. the 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 articulated lorry. Yeah, and obviously given the set of circumstances that that happened in real life yeah. with a driver from Northern Ireland at a haulage firm. Uh, I mean, you literally couldn't write it. It's it's that whole thing of, of life is stranger than fiction. And I think the producers did the right thing in that they they pulled it and, and stuck it on the shelves. So a bit weird, like, because the rest of the world, you know, I've made cousins in Australia or mates out in, in America and LA or whatever, or text going, oh, have you seen it? Have you seen it? And I'm like, no, what 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 happens? What happens? You know, so so it's, it's finally out there, which is good to see. And tell us this, you were saying about that was filmed in 19 and you've obviously started Corey now. How, how do you handle those gaps in between? Um, how, do you keep your, how do you keep your keep your head right? How do you, you know, is it a case of you 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 left here what 20 years ago? Would that be right? Yeah, in 98. I left uh, I graduated from art college in July 98 and by September I'd started drama school. Yeah. So I, yeah, 98. So I, this, this year is the crossover. I, li I have lived more away from home wow. than I lived at home. So yeah, it's a bit bizarre to sort of talk about it like that, you know, but. Uh, and you did, was it graphic design you did, if yeah. I remember correctly? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, visual communications. Right, so okay. I, I sort of got to the end of my A-levels. <laughs> I played for the, uh, the fire service. Feel the uh, physical, you know, hey ho, what can you do? And, uh, but I had applied for our college at the same time. I got my place was working towards the end of my degree um, and then mutual friends of ours by that stage I guess you and I had met yeah, yeah. Um, working with the Ulster Theatre Company yeah. and, and Michael Pointer and a few of, of the guys that were in the cast and um, John Joe O'Neill yeah. um, Debbie McGuire and um, they had all sort of moved off to this mythical place called drama school yeah and I'm a bit like well, hold on a second you, what you can do this as a, as a career what what you can yeah. go away and you can, you can train at this. And so I guess they sort of planted the seed in my head. Yeah. I, I was thinking along the lines, well, if, if they can do it, I'm in the same shoes as them. If they can do it, then maybe I can do yeah. it. And I sort of talked to mum and dad about the whole concept of, because you can have a year out between your last two years 
okay. uh, at college, yeah. um, and I talked about going away and doing a one-year course. And I mean, I'd, maybe it's just being a parent. I because I, because none of my family were in the industry. Yeah. I mean, my granny sang in a choir. That's the, the sort of the closest we got, you know. Um, but they were like, "Listen, please, just finish your degree. Yeah. Do get your head down. Do your last year because the thing." You, you go out there, you go over to England, you'll do, the last thing you're going to want to do when you graduate is come back and finish your degree. Yeah. And, and, and they were 100% right, you know, because as you come towards the end of your, either your three years or your year at drama school, you do what's called a showcase, which is where the agents and casting directors come to see you. Yeah. And it's that point where hopefully you get signed. And then you want to start the ball rolling with getting the auditions and the meetings. So yeah. There's no way I would have packed my stuff and, and coming back to Belfast to finish the degree. So they were they were 100% right in doing that. So I, I finished the degree, graduated in July, and then went off to drama school in the September. So. I mean, you're... It wasn't a... 20 years ago, it, it certainly wasn't an option. Being from the part of Belfast you're from of going... I, I'm going to go and be an actor like that. Just, it was dreaming and stuff. You know what I mean? Um, did you find that a difficult choice to make? Did you? I mean, it's, I say that sort of slightly tongue in cheek, that, that mythical place called drama school, but it's true. Yeah. Um, what was the first, did we do Grace together? Was that the first one we did? I no, it was, was it Oklahoma. Right. Okay. Might have been Oklahoma. Yeah. yeah. That was the, the year after Greece. Yeah. Um, in, in, in the year of Greece, we had a, an assistant, so Michael Pointer directed, but we had an assistant director, um, Kieran McElroy, or Ken McElroy, or Kieran Cregan, um, all these different tax dodges. He's no longer here, God bless his soul, but uh, I'm sure he'd have a laugh at that. Um, Kieran was our assistant director, and he was a boy from Belfast that had gone off to drama school, and he came back. He had worked through Michael's summer shows the same way we did, um, but he had opened, he was original cast in Grand Hotel. Right. At West End. He was original cast in Crazy For You. And again, it's just, you meet these per people along your timeline and you sort of look back and you go, because him and I didn't get on at all. We, <laughs> rubbed okay. other, we, we rubbed each other up. I rubbed him up the wrong way yeah. because I was I was playing the part he had played ten years previous. I was playing Kanicki, yeah, um, and he'd gone off. He knew what it took to be a professional. I'm a 18, 19 year old kid having a great laugh, you yeah. know, during the summer and uh -huh. meeting new people and, and doing a bit of singing, acting, and dancing. And he he drilled me. He was like, "You're not ready to do this eight shows a, a week." Yeah. You, do, you do not have the stamina, you do not have the right attitude. And I, I, hindsight, I can see what he was doing now. Back then, I wanted to chin him. Do you know what I mean? Because he, he's this really handsome looking fella, you know, that does the shoes in the West End. And all the girls in the cast are like, oh, check him out. And I'm like, aye, whatever. Um, but every, any break, any any time I wasn't rehearsing a scene, he had me in the church hall, in the, you know, the, the building beside, yeah. running laps with a chair above my head, singing Grease Lightning. He's like, you have no idea the level that you need to be at to do this. And I, I say, I wanted to chin him. Cut to, I didn't see him for two or three years. Debbie and John, were they and they're fine on you? I, so I, I, was, I started my first year at Guildford School of Acting while Debbie and John were in their third year. So I'd been back and forward oh, right, okay. yeah. um, the year before. So I had sort of got to know their year group. Yeah. And uh, they were doing uh, Grand Hotel weirdly there's the whole you know serendipitous uh, yeah. element of it all they were doing grand hotel at guildford school of acting and he had written them uh break a leg good luck messages on original grand hotel noted head paper from the their, you know the west end show again long story cut short they've done the show we're back at john joe's flat having a party and the doorbell rings and i go and get it and open it and there's kieran he's like glenn i'm like kieran what about you he said, what are you doing here? And I went, oh, I, I, I go to Guildford School of Acting now. He was like, oh, all right. <laughs> right. And, and then so we, we reconnected again, you know. So yeah. I'm sorry, you've asked one question and I've gone off. And I hope you're all right. Grant, then. Grant. Do, and and, do, do you ever see Debbie or John Joe? Or have, do you keep in contact with people? Or do you just drift apart? Or? I haven't seen, I haven't seen John Joe maybe three or four years ago. He was up on a, a, a play at the Exchange. Right, Manchester, 
um, and I was up in a job. Andrew Clark, do you ever remember Andrew Clark? Yeah, yeah. So he's, I mean, we've known each other as long as I've, I've known you. I'm the godfather of his two sons. They live up in Warrington. So, you know, I spent, what, four years up in Liverpool with Hollyoaks. So the Northwest, I feel very comfortable with, you know, yeah. I have, uh, have a ground and a, and a base there. And so um, Joe and John, Joe and I went out for a couple of drinks one night and, and caught up. But then weirdly during lockdown, I think it's given us a real concept of, of connect. Even this. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? It just because when was the last time we saw each other? Yeah, it's a while back, all right. Yeah. Um, Do you know what I mean? But I mean, I think the last time we worked together, what was he? I was in lyric at the time, and you had got a role. Was it a period drama you were in? A period drama. That's very kind of you. Um, was that Arms in the Man? Bingo. There you go. That was it. Uh, yeah. Directed by Dickie Croxford. Um, yeah. Period drama. That's very kind of you. I did grow in some mutton chops, yeah. um, but I think it was it was more like a yeah, it was more like a Big Brother farce on stage. I mean, we had a laugh doing it. Do you know what I mean? It was it was really good crack. I the chocolate soldier, arms in the man, George Bernard Shaw. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, I digress. So yeah, so I think with lockdown and with the, with everybody embracing FaceTime and, and Zoom calls and stuff, John, Joe, and I have been speaking last couple of weeks, really. But yeah. I haven't seen Hayden and Herbin, so I was watching Queen's Gambit on yeah. Netflix, and, and there he pops up, and you're like, oh, happy days. Yeah, because so he popped up, was it, was it a Coen Brothers movie he was in? Aye, yeah, 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 The Ballad of Buster Suggs. Yeah, sitting and watching it, and looking, going, I know that. Wrong here. Yeah. Like, amazing, you know. Um, Debbie I haven't seen for years, so I think she married and lives in New York now, I think. Or, or right, okay. yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, but then again, the last time I probably saw her, was doing a show with the lyric, yeah, where she would have choreographed one of the shows. Um, that I, oh yeah, Dockers Martin, there you go. There's your link, Martin Lynch, yeah, Dockers. Yeah. And we did the what was that, the thirtieth anniversary? For yeah, it would have been. Yeah, it wasn't a couple of years ago, was it? Well, I want to say so. It was eighty one, I think. Yeah. So then you're talking eleven. Wow, could that be? So, so is that ten years ago? I was at the lyric. Yeah, there you go. Time maybe I've made that. Maybe I've made eighty-one up. Maybe it was eighty-four. I don't know. Anyway, but I think it was. I, I think it was the thirtieth. I and there was a wee. There was a wee dance sequence in there, um, in the show, and Debbie came in and choreographed that. So that was probably the last time I saw her. So, uh, do do you have a preference over stage or screen? Um, it fluctuates. Make if I'm honest with you, um, there's nothing beats the immediacy of of an audience. Yeah, um, because that keeps you on the rails. You, yeah. you, you know whether you're doing it right, for want of a better word. You know whether you're doing it right or, or not, just yeah. by that instant response. I mean, I started out working with the local amateur companies, you know, First Act or Four yeah. William or some Daggies. Or, um, and I played with Bernardo, I think, in First Act's West Side Story. So an amateur company that put on two yeah. weeks at the Opera House in Belfast was unheard of. Yeah, um, and I got that's where I caught a lot of my teeth was just doing all those shows as a, as a 16, 17 year old backstage, yeah. suddenly getting the responsibility of going, This is a main auditorium show, you know, it's it was amazing. Yeah. amazing oh, and, and that that theater, I mean, is one of the the, yeah. the greatest theaters in, in the United Kingdom in Ireland. Um, yeah, to be on that stage at 15, 16, insane to, to packed houses, yeah. Yeah, even like because you'd see a big West End show, Common Tour. Yeah. Um, and but but this was and the fact that they that that first act did it for two weeks. Yeah. I guess that was probably the longest run for want of a better word. Uh, you yeah. know what? You know we had the, the weekend off and then you were back in on the Monday. Yeah. And um, but I got to I got the kill. Um, oh, Tony and see now I've gone all Martin Lynch. Um, what's the leader of the Sharks? The Jets and the Sharks. Anyway, it doesn't matter. I got to kill him every night for two weeks. Yeah. Um, and it, it was the bizarrest thing, because obviously, you know, you're, you're in the moment, you're in the scene. But I, I clocked a, a girl, second or third row, on the circle. And it's a plastic gun. Yeah. I killed him the night before, and I'm going to kill him the next night. Do you know what I mean? It's not, it's not real. Yeah. Uh, but for her, in that moment, floods of tears. Like, I could hear, she couldn't breathe. <laughs> And it, it took me right out of where I was. I sort of, you know, side-eyed her. 
and and then you go that's the magic yeah of theater and i think that's probably that's the biggest difference for me between stage and screen because you're effectively shooting up i shot marcella in 2019 yeah it's been and gone yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's committed to work. yeah yeah and, I, and if i wanted to change anything i can't yeah it's, it, that's been and gone and i guess maybe the the halfway house is the the continuing dramas the soaps yeah um which i've been quite fortunate to have done all of them now um is that which is, which is amazing in itself like you, all, all the big ones you've done like that's something else like i yeah, you're right. you, 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 you can you can you know take the compliment you can go to yourself yeah i've done well there like obviously it's it's been over a, what a 15 20 year period and there's gaps in between but it's still a phenomenal achievement like i uh, you're right i listen i have difficulty taking praise so yeah, yeah it is i i guess and the weird thing is Mick, it doesn't really matter how many tv shows i do or, or films or commercials i i left belfast to be in, in in the west end and i haven't done a show in the west end so as far as i'm concerned i failed but okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what you mean. In saying that, if, if if I spoke to any of my mates, you know, yeah. even the ones who are working away in the West End, you know, the ones that have managed to stay in this business for the last, you know, the ones I would have graduated, they're like, ah, oh, no, but look, but look what you're doing, and and so I, I, this this is probably a bit of work I've got to do with myself. But it's also, that, you know, it it could be that thing of maybe all these soaps are the stepping stone to. A West End gig that you haven't come across yet, you know. They could all be learning things and profile things that, that suddenly you'll you'll get the show or the part or whatever it is that you want in the West End. And it's, it could be down the road for you, you know. Well, well, that's a good thing. The job that we do is a lottery ticket. Yeah. And and that's the thing that keeps me going because every meeting you go to could be a yes. Yeah. Now, nine times out of ten, there are no, but that's just part and parcel of of the business. Um. But I was saying, uh, we'll come back to that. Um, the the beauty of the the continuing drama is yeah. that you're still you're still shooting whilst you're on screen. Yeah. So at that point, you go right. Okay, I'm I'm doing too much of this, or I'm not doing enough of that, or camera angle, a craft. It, it is a craft. Yeah, yeah. And, it? and I I sort of liken it to sport i think there's, there's a lot of commonalities um in terms of your physical fitness for the job but yeah. athletics you know you've got usain bolt at one end and you've got mo farah at the other yeah. and both are, are phenomenal world oh, the leaders day. at their disciplines yeah but if you swap them yeah different thing now you can't argue that they're not athletes they are it's just one does one thing and one does another and it's it's sometimes trying to trying to find that that journey between the two, um, so you know working on the soaps, I I sort of describe them as as modern day repertory theatre. You yeah, know, absolutely. You're, yeah. Well, you're being handed a script, but you're also being paid. Yeah. You know, and you're learning your craft on the hoof. You yeah, know, you go. Maybe a, a week at drama school, you maybe get a week's worth of of TV workshops. I mean, I guess I graduated 20 years ago or whatever, so you could argue that it's changed quite a bit in those 20 years. Even even if you think that there was four or five channels then, there's now 505 channels. Yeah. Um, and, you, you know, with the concept of Netflix or Amazon Prime or there's so much stuff being made. I, I think you can leave drama school and go straight into a TV project where yeah. it was almost, you know, you had to go out. And this is before my time. You had to go out and do your repertory theatre. Yeah. Before you then got a break, I, I don't know whether that exists. That has been broken. It, it, yeah, I don't think it exists now. You know, even the concept of, of Zoom meetings with America. Yeah. You, know, you, you can be auditioning for American projects now. Where, it's crazy. Where, like, isn't it? it is crazy. It's fantastic. Yeah. Um, but it is, yeah, it is crazy. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, that's, I'm very grateful to every, every director and or producer who took a punt on me. In yeah. terms of my first theater gig, my first commercial, my first theater job, whatever it is, because they've turned around and gone, yeah, I see something I like in this kid. Yeah. Let's let's give him a crack, and and that's all you can ask for. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I am conscious that you asked the question about twenty minutes ago, and I still haven't answered it. How do I keep myself going? Um, yeah, in, in between, you know. Um, 
I, I suppose as well, maybe is it more difficult with the, the profile of the subs you're on? You know, if you're going from one job to the next, you've still got to earn money. You've still got to do something. But, you know, it's, it's a lot harder to go, right, well, I'll go and get a job on the checkout in Asda after you've been on East Enders. Do you know what I mean? There's a whole different way of going, you know, how do you keep your head in check and be, and be real with yourself, but you've still got to pay bills, you know? Yeah, yeah, the world... I, I mean, I foolishly thought that I could still be a job and actor, for want of a better word. Yeah. Whenever I went into Hollyoaks, you turn up, you do your gig, and you go home. Yeah. Um, and that, <laughs> one could argue that was maybe a little naive, Michael. Yeah. Um, and I mean, yeah, I, I did any amount of jobs before that. Um, but thankfully, one of my last jobs before I went into Hollyoaks was working on a call centre. So at least, I don't mean this in a bad way, but at least you're not public facing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So you can hide behind a set of headphones and a, and a microphone. Um, and so I did go back in there um, after Hollyoaks. But, you know, I, listen, I, I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't do drugs. Any any money that I earn, uh, I sort of split as soon as the paycheck comes in. You know, 10% goes into the rainy day fund, 20% goes into the tax fund, and the other 70% I stash in a, in a separate bank account. And I, and I pay myself a wage every month. Yeah. So I've, I've done bits and pieces of teaching, but... Yeah, from Hollyoaks, I've, I've been able to, thankfully, touch wood, um, been able to sort of self-sustain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which is good. Although I'm saying that, during the first lockdown, I was starting to write my, my muggle CV, my non-acting CV that I, I haven't had to write for a few years because, you're right, we've all got to pay bills, you know? Yeah, yeah. that's... And in, in terms of um, kind of drive and will, um, is it just a self-belief going, well, look, I believe something's going to come up or I'm, I'm just going to trust in the process or the or the universe or whatever or what what is the thing that keeps you going to the additions and maybe getting a no but going well dust it off and i'm going to go back to it it's not even maybe getting a no mike <laughs> you've got you've got to accept you're getting a no yeah 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 it's yeah. just how many how many no's um i think i mean that's a that's a big box to unravel but let's do it it's never personal yeah. When you get the new, it's 100% personal. You know, not the right height, not the right build, not the right accent, not the right energy, not the right concept of the, the character, whatever it may be. But it's not personal. Yeah. And uh, I used to lose, I, I could lose a week after what I would consider a bad audition, i.e., I didn't get the job. And that's the wrong mindset to be yeah. going into. Because if you have three meetings in the week and you have a stinker on the Monday, then that's going to negatively hit your Wednesday and your Friday. And, and so within, I don't know, three, six months of graduating, I made a deal with myself that you give yourself the tube ride home. So wherever you are, I was living in Elephant Castle. As soon as I got off the tube at Elephant Castle, that was it, gone. So you, right. you can go and you can go, ah, what if I did that? Or did they mean that when they said that? Or what if I, you know, so you'd run through, maybe it, maybe it, I could have been better on my lines, maybe I could have listened a bit more to the feedback that they were giving me, whatever it was. And then as soon as you get off, that was it, let it go. And so... Don't and that, of, that, that obviously has been working for you? You have to find, you have to find what works for you. You have to find what, what, what keeps you going. Um, be that a family life, be that uh, a hobby that you have outside. I, that was quite difficult for me, I think. So growing up in Belfast, I was working on a petrol station. I was going to our college. Yeah, and then I was rehearsing the the shows like Forty Second Street or West Side Story, and so whenever I moved across to, to England to go to drama school, my my hobby effectively then became my job. Yeah, and I found that quite a difficult transition because then you almost put a lot of pressure on the thing that you love doing for free. Yeah, and yeah. so that was a balancing act. Um, but I, you know, listen in the, in the last twenty years. There's easily been, I think I could say definitely three occasions where I'm like, that's it. No more. I, I just, I can't do it. Um, and what is it that keeps you going? It's interesting that you say self-belief. Um, I, I guess there must be an element of it. I, I, yeah, there's there's, there's got to be, whether you want to call it, uh, you know, will or spurred or driver, whatever way you want to package it, there, there's definitely got to be something there that keeps you going. 
I'm just going to hang in for another bit or I'll make that decision not to do it at a certain point or is it just that you've decided right I'm not going to do it and then something else has come along just at that moment yeah I'm a firm believer that this is the best job in the world when you're doing it yeah but unfortunately the flip side of that coin is it's the worst job in the world when you're not doing it and what you need is you need that nine to five, that Monday to Friday, nine to five with a boss who understands that you're committed to it, yeah. but ultimately you're not committed to it. Yeah. Uh, and I've had a couple of great bosses along the line. Um, Connor, uh, Marks and Spencers, on uh, Oxford Street, uh, second generation Irish. He loved me. So I'd be like, Connor, I have a meeting this afternoon. Is there any chance? He'd be like, right, but you're doing Sunday all day, double shift. I'm like, Connor, no bother, mate. Do you yeah. know what I mean? But Connor could had every right to turn around and go, no, mate, that, that's your shift, you're down. And then that's the end of that job for me because I've got to leave. Um, or Darren in the call centre, who trained as an actor, who understood that I could give his team the ability to pick up a script and make it sound real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, so he was able to, to use and utilise my skill sets. So when it came to a casting or a couple of days off for a commercial or whatever it might be, he'd be like, yeah, all right, no bother. And, you know, so yeah. you've just got to find those people as you go along that, that are willing to support your your career choice that you made over 20 years ago that you didn't really understand what it meant when you said, I, I go to drama school, you know? Um, do, you, do you have any regrets going to drama school? I think it was the best move. I mean, alternatively, what would you have done? Would you, would you have followed the career in visual communications and graphics and maybe okay got a, a house in the car and a nice safe job and and this gnawing thing just gnawing here going but what if you know i think i work with plenty of talented really super talented people in all the amateur companies that i work with in northern ireland yeah and i could see that they had the monday to friday nine to five house car yeah and i'm like but you you could be doing this yeah, and they're like, nah, nah, and and now I can see yeah. where they were coming from. Yeah, because there's no career progression, there's no ladder that we we climb on this job, um, and I can see them with their houses and their cars. And I think it's it's moments like that where you turn around and go, what am I doing? What what what's it all for? And then you're right. Invariably, there is. It's either a meeting that gets you interested. Or it's an actual job offer where you go, yeah. hi, all right. I'll stick, I'll stick my name in the hat again. I'll, I'll keep going again. You know, and friends and family, you know, those yeah. are the people that can turn around. Like even I did a couple of interviews for Curry the other day. And they're right in what they're saying. It doesn't actually matter what you do in the rest of your career. As soon as you do Curry, was well, your man's delighted. Well, that's it, like. So that's, that's it, game over. So alone saying that, I did a commercial with um, George Went. Do you ever remember Norm from Cheers? Yeah, yeah. I did, this is early 2000s. Um, I did a Smithics commercial with George Went. But Norm that's from Cheers. That's probably up there, like. Well, my dad, my dad then, was, he sent the text going, that's it. You, you may give up now, you retire. It's, it's not going to get any better. Drinking beer with Norm in a bar all day and getting paid for it, sort of. Brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah. But, but then that was a real that was a real eye opener into status. Yeah. Within, within the industry, you know, because you've got two actors sitting side by side in the same bar, the grave diggers. This bar, Smithix used to use it all the time. I think it was a horseshoe shaped bar, and they'd yeah. literally close one half off for the crew and, and for the acting, and the other half were all the regulars who would sit. The horse race and the beyond, they'd be sitting, you know, with their racing post out and their pints, drinking away, chatting away, and then they go and roll up, and they'd all you do your wee bit of acting, cut, and then they carry on the conversation. You're like, what, what's going on in here, you know? Um, but yeah, oh, any time that was cut, somebody popped up from underneath the bar, and there was a drink for George, and there was a fan for George, and George and, and everything are and I'm like, You all right there, George? <laughs> it was oh, it was bizarre, and then you go, oh really? Right, there's a there's a packing order here. Yeah, yeah, well that did. Yeah, but what amazing gig to get. I'm, I'm, I'm with Curry as well. That's a, it's a, I mean, it's a big thing. That's one of the ones where you, you, your family will be as, as proud as, and everyone that they know will be saying to him, "Oh, he's 
curry now. He's got curry. Like it's a, yeah, yeah, big, it's, uh, it's crazy. And again, this goes back to, to me saying earlier on about being naive, you know, being the job and actor. When I first started Hollyoaks, even if even if you weren't in every episode that week, yeah, and I'll speak primarily about Hollyoaks, your face was in the titles, in the credits. Yeah. And there's something about doing the, the, the soaps where you're in people's living rooms. Yeah. And there, there's an ownership. And, and I'll have done it also. You think you know the person. Yeah. Because yeah. they're in your front room. Now, you could do a Marcella and it doesn't come out for two years. And you would have no... I think you can go away and you can do a bit of theatre in the West End or a Broadway or whatever, or you can do standalone dramas because it's only on for six or eight weeks. And then it's not that it's forgotten, yeah. but there's this, in the, in the soaps, there's just this constant reminder that, that you're part of the family. Yeah. And I think the penny really dropped for me. i um, a bit embarrassed to admit this. Uh, no, I'm all right, but I can open this. Sex in the City. Yeah. So me and my flatmate at the time, whenever they brought out the first movie, we went to the cinema to watch it. I mean, I'm quite, I, I like to go to the, I don't like anybody else in the cinema when I'm there. I just want it to be me so that I can concentrate. No rustling of sweets or no talking or texting or whatever. Um, and it was, what I realised was, so there was a scene where, oh, I'm not going to remember the names, Miranda, is it the girl with the red hair? Anyway, her and Steve. Steve's had an affair, right? right? I think me and Gilly were probably the only two blokes in the whole cinema, right? This place fucking erupted. Steve! I mean, like haranguing the guy in a you know five hundred seat cinema. Yeah. What's going on? And it was because the audience know those characters from their living room that they're going to talk to the screen. Yeah. They're going to be like, "How dare you do that?" So whenever uh, the the Miranda, I think it is Miranda, then she had like an affair to get back at, at Steve. Oh man! Whoa, go on, Miranda! And and it, and, and it, it, at that point, I went, "All right, okay, I get this." Yeah. I, when you're in somebody's living room, yeah, like I say, whether you're in the episode or not, there's a there's a there's an ownership of that character because those people have been watched. Corey's just done their sixtieth year. That's insane. It 60th. is insane, and 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 you hear it, and you go, yeah, all right, yeah. And then they did a was it just before Christmas or they did like a sixtieth anniversary, and you watch it, and you go, wow. Like the first, I think it was commissioned for 13 eps and it was shot live. Wow. And then you're like, and Bill Roach, who plays Ken Barlow, has been in it from episode one. And you're like, I mean, that's, that's, as it was my mum, mid 60s. So she was what, six or seven, whenever that started. And I'd still go. Yeah. It's, it's, it's phenomenal. It is. It's, and it's, it's great to be part of it, mate. And like I said to you earlier, I've, I've, I've heard a lot of love for the Northwest. Um, I mean, living in Liverpool for the, the four years on Hollyoaks, you may as well have been in Belfast because there were that many of us that were working in the bars and the restaurants, you know, serving yeah. you because you come across to go to university. And there's something about working class cities yeah. based on the docks. Yeah. We're all the same. Aye. We all know each other. And, uh, and Manchester's the same. I mean, I've had a season ticket at Old Trafford 12, 13 years now. And so I've been in and out of that city. I could have moved to it 15 years ago. Um, yeah. It didn't happen for one reason or another. I, I, the only downside is it rains, which is the same as Belfast, which yeah. is one of the reasons why I left. Um, yeah. Because it's it's that, you know, that rain that soaks you right through. You know, that <laughs> fine, fine, that Belfast rain. I mean, I tell you what, it's been sunny today, but last week it was, you know, where it's just that week of rain. It's just, everything's grey and it's, you know, grand. Yeah. I right. used to, cause I lived, I lived, you know, with mum and dad um, when I was doing the, the viscom, the graphics. And the few days I'd be like, you know, mum would wake me up, right, go on, you're going into college today. And I go, is it raining? She'd go, oh, I go, nah, I'll do it tomorrow. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Just, oh, I hate it, hate it. But anyway. So there was a, a, a short film that yours I was watching the other day. Um, the Road to Gehenna. Yeah. Tell, tell me about that. So, How did that come about? I mean, it's... It's a great piece. I think you're you're great in it, and as well, you, you're. It's a very different. Would, would be fair to say it's a very different role from what. One hundred percent, and that's exactly the reason why I took it, Mick. Yeah. Um, it, that was a no budget. I got I got paid, ninety quid for the fuel up and down, and I got my lunches and my dinners 
yeah. as, as the package. Um, and it's that tricky one where you go to your agent, you go, I've read this script, I'm really interested in it. And they go, how much? Because, you know, it's a business. Yeah. And you go, 90 quid and a couple of sandwiches. And they're like, okay. Because obviously, you know, they're, uh, and they're also conscious of my career. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? But my argument to them was, so how did it come about? So you go to drama school for three years and you get an agent. Michael Keogh was the director. Mm-hmm. And he and I, I'd never met him, but we had a, a couple of mutual friends. So via Facebook, I had seen that he'd started up a, an acting class in Manchester and he was bringing, I mean, I live in the Midlands right. and he was bringing one to Birmingham. And there's something about, it's a major difference between the, the British Irish mindset and the, the American mindset. Cause when you're out in LA, you take classes. Yeah. It's like going to the gym. You're constantly working your craft. Yeah. And I think there's the element in the, in the UK and Ireland where once you've gone, gone to drama school, that's it. There's no yeah. more training to be done. And I'm like, no, that's not how it works. You, you learn on every job you do. And yeah. if you're not doing the job, you've got to find a creative outlet to be working yeah. that same muscle, that, that creative muscle. And so anyway, I dropped Michael a line going, hiya, Michael, I, I know we don't know each other. A couple of mutual friends. I see you're doing this class. Do you mind if I come along just to sit and observe? And I was like, yeah, of course. And so he did two, two sessions back to back. I did say the half four one. And I was like, do you mind if I hang in for the second one? And he went, he, and then you could see the suspicious mind. He's like, I, why? And I went, well, cause it's gonna be another 20 new people with 20 new ideas. And, yeah. and there's nothing really like that here in the UK. There's that many in, in LA and I imagine New York as well, although I don't have as much experience there. Um, and so I sat on the, in on the class and what he was teaching, I was like, there's something in this. And so him and I then became mates, I guess. We, we connected. We had those mutual friends. We'd worked on a couple of jobs, similar jobs, but at different times. And, and so I'd gone in and there was one of the days he went, listen, he says, I've, I've, I've got the script on the go. I'm, I'm making the move. I'm, I'm still acting. I'm doing the teaching, but I, I want to I wanna get into directing. I've got this piece. I think you'd be you'd be spot on for one of the characters. Would you read it? And I'm like, throw me the script, mate. Of course, I'll go and read it. And it's and then to be fair to him, he this is his second short. He he shot another one called Underwater, and um, which has just been baffed and longlisted. So he shot it sort of six months a year before Gehenna. Um, but it was exactly what I was looking for because it's not the character I get seen for. Yeah. And um, now it's weird because we we work in a creative industry. But sometimes, and this might <laughs> work to my detriment, sometimes I fear that it's not the most creative in sure. that you get pigeonholed and yeah. stereotyped. Now, I'm going to take the positive of that and I'm going to say, find out what your stereotype is, find out what people think you are and then be the best version at that. Yeah. And then once you get a body of work behind you and or a profile, like you were mentioning earlier on with regards to the, the West End, once you then you can start having discussions about playing outside yeah those those norms those types it, it's it, like if i am doing tv workshops or whatever with with students i'll get them in pairs to go and stand in the street corner for 20 minutes half an hour and ask 10 random people what age do you think i am what job do you think i do because whenever you walk into the room yeah that's what you're bringing now listen that's not to say that i can't play a 90 year old black female in a wheelchair yeah it's probably never going to happen because there's there's enough of those people to do that job without me having to do do you know what i mean yeah and especially then on high turnover television it's effectively and i don't i don't want to do a disservice here what do you put the energy people used to talk about it as as weight not not how yeah. fat you are or how skinny you are weight experience yeah it's of no surprise to me that of all the 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 projects that i've done it's teacher lawyer surgeon doctor you know and and when all the stuff from back home 20 years ago was either uvf or ira thug now i can shave my head and i can put fake tattoos on and i can i can throw a bit of a stronger belfast accent on but when there are people already sort of turning up looking like that, yeah, you know, it is what it is. And and I, I guess I can't afford to shave my head 
and then get new photographs taken every time. You, you just got to hope that the director or the, the cast yeah. and team or the makeup department can go. Like even um, Trevor Buchanan in The Secret. Did you see The Secret? Uh, then, uh, Jimmy Nesbitt, The Dentist. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. That was great. I, mean, I could have really gone in. Sorry? That was a really good gig. Like, it was a couple of years ago, wasn't it? I was a cracker. Uh, yeah. I was an absolute cracker. And, and, yeah. and, I, and I do feel slightly guilty saying that because my experience on the job was phenomenal. The, the production team looked after as well. It was a, a really well detailed, thought out, written script. Yeah. I, I, but then there were points either in the read through or, or when you were on the floor shooting and you, you had to go, oh, actually, this happened. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And, and so for me to say I really enjoyed it, I always sort of, I feel as if I have to back that up by going, listen, my experience of the TV show, but this was somebody's life, yeah. is still somebody's yeah. life, you know? Um, but I could have had exactly the same talent, personality, and been five foot six and blonde. I probably wouldn't have got the job as Trevor Buchanan because ultimately there was a similarity. Yeah. And then once you get costume, you know, the other departments involved, costume and makeup. There was one thing they did, it was genius. Because it was, uh, was it mid-80s, late-80s? Sideburns. So yeah. uh, Trevor Buchanan was a, a copper peeler. Yeah. And so they dyed the hair dark to look like his. And you're looking at him, you're going, yep, and you've got the RUC uniform on, you're like, ah, all right. And then, and then makeup, go, hold on a second, Glenn, just turn your head. And they cut the sideburns off at the top of the ear. And instantly... Yeah. I was a copper in the mid to late 80s. Yeah. And uh, some of the, the stock photography that they took, you know, for the, for the family house, for around the house, they put like a, a dodgy um, cop duster on the top. Yeah. And you're like, there you go, I'm a, I'm a copper in the 80s. It's, it's genius. It's genius. But just, sorry, we get on the stereotype in there. How, how do, how... Uh, because I was asking about the, that role in that particular film. Was... Gehenna. Yes, good lad. So I, I, my argument is I don't get seen for that part. Yeah. I, I, I don't. And, and that's, again, because of what I bring into the room and because what my CV suggests. Yeah. You know? And so for me, that was a punt. I liked Michael. I loved his first, for a, for a debut short, Underwater, I thought was stunning, was visual. Yeah, yeah. And when we talked through how he wanted to shoot it, I'm like, mate, I'm in. And that was a weekend, uh, yeah, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Wow. And we shot that. Um, and it served its purpose. Yeah. And that I've got a friend for life. I've got a collaborator. Yeah. And I'm sure this is something that you're, you're interested in as well. People that, that you know, yeah. people that you can trust, uh, people that you have a shorthand with. Like, you can understand why that happens in this business. Yeah, yeah. Um, like, you've always got to hope that there, there's a director or a casting director is always going to... Uh, Dickie Croxford actually uh, going back to Arms and the Man at the Lyric, he was always saying, you know, 80 90% of the job is in the cast. And if you get the casting right, yeah. it takes care of itself. And I think he worked on was it, was it a 70 30 principle? So he would work with people he knew, but for every job he did, he'd have three or four positions yeah. uh, where he didn't know the person and yeah. he would bring them in. And I'm like, that, that's the way it's got to work. Yeah. You know, you've got, to, you've got to have enough that you know the project will work. Yeah, yeah, and then you've got a, an opening for that that element of, of new. You know, what can this person, what, what are they going to bring in the rehearsal room? Yeah. So for me, Gehenna was a, was a punt um, and a punt that paid off. Yeah. And it was only three days following, do you say? Yeah. Oh, it's ridiculous, mate. Absolutely ridiculous. But, you know, he, he part funded that himself. He has a lot of self-belief that maybe I need to take a little bit of I'll take a, bit of, a, a leaf out of his book, you know. Uh, he he's he's going to be a director, yeah, yeah. Regardless, and if it means him having to fund it himself, he'll do it. But yeah. hopefully, he's get to that level. Uh, like I say, Underwater's been long listed for the Baptist, so that's amazing. Like, yeah, for a for a debut for a debut show, yeah, unbelievable. Sure. So, no, but thanks. I I mean, again, the the, the subject matter, for yeah. Those of, us who haven't seen it, you know, it's a little yeah. bit dark, but but then that's where, where can people can people access it on? Yeah, it's but there's a, a, a <laughs> Marcella, Marcella. So there's a Vimeo or Vimeo, yeah, Vimeo or yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So there's and I'll I'll send it to you. Uh, yeah. And if you have any I'll social media, like or something, yeah. Like below. yeah, yeah. Have a watch. It's sixty minutes of your your time. Yeah. I think it's. I think it's a, a, for me, it was a great exercise. See, it's yeah. also that thing, you, you want to be challenged. 
Yeah. It was, it was a challenge for me. There's not one piece of that project I found easy or comfortable. Yeah. But the thing is, whenever you're going into an East Enders, sorry, excuse me, or a Coronation Street or a Holby, it's almost like they don't want it to be a challenge. Yeah. Because they, they have so much content to shoot in such a restricted amount of time. Yeah. That, yeah, I, I don't think cast directors or, or directors like like to think that it's a challenge for you. Yeah. I don't know. It's, it's a weird one. But I, I, I enjoyed that. And do you find that this, much like that role, much like that film, because it was a challenge and because it probably, probably then scares you a bit, going, okay, it's a challenge, I'm up for it. And at some point, the fear is going to hit you, you know, the day or two beforehand going, shit, have I bitten off more you can chew? Do you find it by kind of going into the things that challenge you more, you get more out of? Yeah. Yeah, I guess there's, uh, I, love, I love that you think it happened a couple of days before. It, ha <laughs> it, it happened the whole way through the weekend, mate. I'm not going to lie right to enough. you. We shot the, the exterior stuff. So the kid in the, the opening sequence with the yeah. red land, that's Michael's son, Gabe. Right. Um, so we, we shot all that stuff first and then we moved into the house. Um, and again, spoiler alert, so it was the, the three priests, four priests. So there was a lot of scripture involved. Yeah. And with a Corey or a Hobie or whatever, well, maybe not so much Hobie, you've got the framework of a script and, and, and you work around it. You yeah. can't busk scripture. No, I, I, I couldn't have any doubts about anything about what that individual was going to do, yeah. because that was the whole reason why he was there. Because if there was any doubt, he wouldn't have been there and the, and the project wouldn't have been shot because it wouldn't have happened. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so there was no room for error. Yeah. But that whole sequence around the kitchen table, I mean, that was effectively four scenes that ran start to finish. Right. Because you had me with the first priest. Yeah. Me with the second, then the third join. Yeah. And so, yeah, it was, that was a big challenge. Um, and to answer your question, did I get, I guess, satisfaction? I don't mean that in, a, in an arrogant check me out. But if the meeting comes along that requires that type of character. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd feel fairly confident now going in for that meeting. Yeah. Where before you'd be a bit like, yeah, but I always play the policeman or the doctor. No, no, I have, there's, there's that darker side that that if required i could i could access yeah now, at, at the time of shooting it are, are you so in it and trying to get it right that you, you you don't have time to panic or in between takes is is your stomach and nuts and you go am i getting this right or so i i've let go of am i getting it right Okay. And this this is 20 years worth of experience. So I, I talked earlier about the tube ride home. Yeah. Nick Murphy directed uh, The Secret. Yeah. And weirdly, the email that we, I'm going to jump again. So remember where we were, right? Because yeah. I forgot. Um, Nick Murphy sent out, before we did the auditions, he sent an email out to everybody that he was meeting, going up, just to let you know, I have no interest in actors. I, I don't want to see an actor. I this is This is based on a true story. This has to almost be documentary. People yeah. have to believe that they're seeing this. I have no interest in actors. I was like, wow, okay, that's an interesting concept. Went and did the meeting. Had a great meeting in, in that it was a collaboration. He was interested in my thoughts and opinions and we could have a dialogue, which was lovely. And then at the end of it, he goes, great actor, son, great acting. And I'm walking out through the door going, oh, fuck, I've, I've, I've totally fucked up because he said he didn't want actors. Oh, no. And I've gone, I've, I've gone, that, that's my whole world, fuck's sake. Because yeah. because that that job at that particular time is a step up for me. Yeah. yeah Do you yeah. know what I mean? And so, not that I put pressure on myself, but I want that. And then because the meeting was so collaborative, I want that even more. And yeah. then he goes, great acting, son. I'm like, fuck, he didn't want an actor, bollocks. Cut to, I get the job, and then we're out in Belfast. And this is what I mean about the production company. You know, they took us out for meals and stuff. They, they really looked after as well. And I happened to be sitting beside Nick for one of the, the meetings. And I went, here, listen, I have, I have a bone to pick with you, son. He goes, all right, what's that? I went, so this whole thing about I don't want actors. Uh-huh. And he explained his rationale. I went, no, I totally get that. Actually, but as I'm walking out of the room, you go, great bit of acting there, son. And he went, did it? Oh, I didn't even think about that. 
So it was a throwaway line that ruined the week of my life. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. um, so, sorry, I told you to remember where we were. So I was asking that when you're in that moment of shooting that, that, that series of four scenes with the, the three other guys and a scripture and it's heavy in between takes, does the fear attack you? And you see your right. people to... So you were saying, and do you think that's good enough? And I'm saying, I've let that go. So Nick, I'll go back to Nick again. Nick said, listen, mate, and this is, this is one of those bits of information that you go, I need to hold on to this. And when I'm doing workshops, I try and get this across. He said, you have to understand that I could have seen 100 people for Trevor. The time that I have in the room and the money and the budget, I can see 10 people. Yeah. So I already know that you can do the job before you come into the room. That's non-negotiable. You, I've seen your CV. The casting director who works 365 days a year knows your work and has said to me, Nick, you need to see this guy. I think he'd be right for, for Trevor. He said, so this whole, and this is, we come out of drama school going, or auditions going, am I good enough? Yeah. I, I've had that, again, you couldn't tell me that 20 years ago now. It's only because of the work that I've done and the people that I've met, where Nick goes, I knew you could do the job. What I had to find out was, could we work together on the floor? Yeah. What's his personality like? How does he take notes? What's his ideas on the character? And so there was another producer um, that I, I did a Q&A with. Um, he likened cast, the casting process as sitting on a train ride with somebody for two hours. Do, right. I, want, do I want to do a train journey with this person for two hours? He says, and this is a theatre producer, because he's going, because effectively that's what I'm asking my audience to do is to sit down with you. And then it comes back to that, you know, don't be a dick. Yeah. I mean, you can't really be taught that coming out of drama school, but don't be a dick. It's a, it's a good lesson. Like. <laughs> In life, not yeah. even this job that we do. Do you know what I mean? So going back, I'm sitting there going, I'm a good enough. And this is the difference between stage and screen, possibly again, or how I approach it. It doesn't really matter what I'm feeling. Mm-hmm either as a character or an actor, mm-hmm. because I can't see the monitor that the director's watching. Yeah. And they're, they're telling a story through that. I, I can't see that. And in many ways, unless it's technical, mm-hmm. I don't want to see that because what I think is that ego can get involved. Yeah. And I think ego is the worst thing when it comes to creativity. Once you start letting your ego get involved, because it's not me, and it's going to sound a bit wanky, maybe. It's not me on screen. Yeah. It's Trevor. Yeah. Or it's Lucas in Coronation Street, or it's Malachi in Hollyoaks. It's not Glenn. Yeah. And I can't afford to get that mixed up. So if I'm ever in doubt, I guess as an actor, my question to the gaffer is, are you happy? Yeah. Because they're the ones that are going to be sitting in the editing suite going, ah, I didn't get this or I didn't get that. Yeah. And, and again, that's, that's, that's gone. You've missed that. So there, there are, I guess, sometimes you, you turn around and go, I think I've got a better one in the tank. Yeah. If we've, if we've got the time, can we go again? I just think there's a, a little bit of nuance that I can tease out or I can play or there's a look that I want to do or, but, but ultimately it's the gaffer's decision. And I go, as long as you're happy, I'm happy to move on. So. And um, was your approach to that film more like your approach to a play than a, than a soap? just because of the, the, the context of the, the text itself? Yeah, yeah, I guess so. I mean, you're right, but what I didn't have was the four weeks worth of rehearsal. Yeah. So, so in, a, in a play, you know, I mean, I'm making a stereo, uh, sweeping statements here, but say you've got your four weeks worth of rehearsal. Effectively, you can learn a play through rehearsals without learning it, if yeah. that makes sense because it goes through the process of osmosis and the process of repetition. That's the one thing you don't get on on the dramas or the, well, you get time on the dramas, on the continuing dramas, the soaps. There's not really that that time. And so sometimes I find myself having to physically learn lines. Yeah. And and then it almost becomes a little like homework. And you go, it's not really what I, I I didn't get into for this. You know, there, there are certain, if a scene is over three pages long or a piece of dialogue that I have is longer than three lines, I'm probably going to have to f- actually spend time and learn it. Right, okay. Or 
we're not, and, and you couldn't have told me this before doing Hollyoaks. It's, it's weird how you adapt to the given circumstances because I was literally writing out my lines like lines. I must not talk in class. I must not talk in class. I must not. That, that was how. And it came and bit me on the arse in Hollyoaks. It was maybe the first, second month I was in and somebody phoned in sick. And so the three or four scenes that I had spent writing out like lines the night before, I've gone into work the next morning. They go, oh, you're not shooting that one, Mick, today because Mick's not well. You're, you're shooting these three scenes with Frankie. And, and wow. my world fell out of my arsehole. Yeah. Because I, and then you go right. Okay, how and and you just you just do it. But then I'm I'm going to contradict myself by that. You know, it's sometimes it feels like work, and I uh, that's not what I signed up for. Ultimately, you're a professional. Yeah. And so sometimes it has to be like work nice. because it is work. Yeah, yeah. And and they're paying you generally, you know, decent money. Yeah. That whenever they say action, it's got to happen. You, you deliver your side of the bargain. And again, yeah. there you go, Road to Gehenna. That was a Jason Dunn um, who played um, the priest that came in at the end. Yeah, he'd done he'd done a, a shit ton of work. Waterloo Road, I think, is probably the one he's best known for. Uh, there was a, you learn something new on every job. Yeah, because I at points in that job, I felt a little bit of the, the weight of it, and I was going, "Listen, lads, I'm really sorry." So on their singles, I would have still have the lines. Yeah, because I didn't I didn't want to cock up their single. Yeah. And they're like, do whatever you have to do, mate. Don't worry about it. When, whenever the camera turns on you and it's your single, you're going to do what you want to do. So, um, and Jason turned around and went, he said, stop apologizing. He said, they don't, they don't care. He said, as, as long as you deliver between cut and action, they, they don't care what the rest of the journey is. Yeah. yeah. And, and they don't. And, and that, that's the job, I guess, is, is to, to be able to, to deliver between yeah. cut and action. And that, again, that released a lot of the pressure. Because you're like, right, okay, I don't need to worry about all the rest of this shit. And just, I can just focus on what I'm, what I'm meant to be doing. So if there was a, is there, is there a part that you've always wanted to play? Is there a play that you've always wanted to be in? If, if someone was to turn around you tomorrow and go, okay, we're going to put a play on the West End playing, uh, pick your part, what would it be? Or is it just the the being there and doing that is there a certain role you've always wanted or um i'm happy to be working yeah because i i think i mean we've all heard the stats about the the amount of actors that are out of work at any given time and i have been able to carve a career for 20 plus years so i know that i'm one of the very fortunate ones um is there a role I, the next role is the best role yeah in that sense, um, Martin Madonna, um, yeah, yeah. The, the Lieutenant of Hanish Moore. Yeah, um, that, uh, have you read? Is that the one with the cat? See, I'm I'm putting the pressure on you now. Oh no! Nah. <laughs> so there's a Martin, let's just say yes, it is. <laughs> Martin Madonna, the Lieutenant of Hanish Moore. That was one. Of, that was one where I come out of the watching it in the West End. Yeah. Um, and I phoned my agent straight away and went. Whenever they're recasting that, get get me a meeting, yeah. get me a meeting, because it was it was pulp fiction with Irish accents. Yeah, I I couldn't believe what they were doing on stage. It uh, that blew me away. And again, there there we go back to the magic of theatre. Yeah, you know where it's it's happening right in front of you. I don't, have you have you seen it? I don't want to give I don't want to give too much away. I'm trying to think. I've seen a series of them. Is it Martin or who did the Pillow Man? Is that the brother? All right, buddy, I'll see you later. Yeah. See you later. Who did the pillow man? Was that Michael McDonald? See, this is where we're going to embarrass ourselves by not really knowing. Let it, let it look. <laughs> there's, uh, there, there's two of them. So I can't, I think it might have been Michael. There's, there's one, a, a play called The Pillow Man, and I remember watching it in the lyric, and I think it just started it in the job in the opera house. So it was probably 2000. And, 14 or 15 and it was the first time I walked in and sat down and watched the play and was blown away in in as long as I can remember because yep. when I spent about seven seven or eight years working the lyrics so when you get the no buildings and places 
and you know people on the production team whenever I mean I can see when the lighting cue is going to come I can almost guess yep. Yep, yep, what yep. sound effects going to come from what speaker and without being cynical about it can be sitting half the time going I'm very aware that I'm watching a play whereas when I watched the pillow man the house lights went down and it started and then suddenly it was over and I just spent the entire time with my jaw open going Whoa. just totally you know? transfixed Unbelievable. Into it all. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was insanely and, good. And that, that, and again, I think that's the magic of theatre. Yeah, yeah. Don't get me wrong, all this stuff that we're getting now, you know, and because of the forced lockdown and stuff, it's still, like even going to the cinema where everything's just dark. Yeah. When when you're in the house and you stick a movie on and the phone rings or the, the washing machine beeps because it's finished and it takes it just pulls you. I, I want to be lost in that world. I want to be immersed in, in that world. Same as it's weird you say that the woman in black, scurriest uh, piece of theatre in the in the London's West End. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, but the person in the, the rocking chair is the ASM. <laughs> there's, there's, that's, there's somebody sitting in that and they, they've been on the book. Yeah, and they've had to leave it. So yeah, I, I I totally get that. That's that's that whole thing of when you work in it. Yeah. Like even when you when you watch stuff back, like does Tom Cruise ever pick Tom Cruise? Does Daniel? Well, maybe Daniel Day. This is different. Does Tom <laughs> Cruise? Because he, he's he's going. Oh yeah, that day we had to wrap early because of the weather, or the helicopter was costing me another hundred and fifty k because, and so I don't think. I don't think you can ever watch a project that you're in start to finish and detach yourself from the actual experience of doing it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Lieutenant to Finish More, hope I've got that right. Uh, it was Pulp Fiction. They they actually, they battered a body. Like the first five rows were covered in blood. Yeah. And I'm I'm watching this in the theater. So yeah, I mean, if that ever, I'm probably too old now to be fair. Um, I'd have to reread the, the cast list. Was but, there another one? Was it his or his brothers? Or was, it was two brothers. And it was, again, it, it was like Frail Meets Tarantino, where they ended up making all these wee figurines and they're, you know, come the end of the play, they're out with shotguns and blowing up cookers and all sorts. Like it was brilliant. insane stuff, like burning stuff, you know, just I, I suppose it's that thing of it'd be like a magician watching another magician and going, I don't know how I did the trick. I don't know how, to, yeah, how. You know, yeah. that's, that's the thing that makes you go, right, that's, that's how you know it's on the money, like. Yeah. No, I, I, I but then that, that could be real bittersweet. So going across to Guildford, we did Oklahoma together. So I, I'd done Oklahoma a couple of times, also theatre company, Fort William Youth, I think I'd done it with. Um, and there was this production at the National that had transferred into uh, the Lyceum where the Lion King is now. And uh, Hugh Jackman. Yeah, before, pre pre uh, Wolverine days, Hugh Jackman and uh, Maureen Lipman, and I'm like, I, just, I mean, if there's a show I can do, I I I know I know Oklahoma, I can do this, and because of the transfer, then you know it's a good show, so I got a ticket to go and see it, and I I literally sat in the <laughs> in the stalls going, I'm never going to work a day in this industry because the talent that was coming off that stage was phenomenal, so like that magician going i can't work that one out i don't think i should be a magician anymore you know it can be real bittersweet because the flip side of that is paying money and watching something going well i could have done that better there's nothing and, more there's well, nothing more. an arrogant way but yeah yeah i mean see to be honest with you I'm, I'm not trying to be arrogant the only reason i had to go writing plays was there was a venue i was working in and out of 10 or 15 plays to go in, I just sat watching them go on. And I actually said to myself, I could write better than that. And then I went, right, well, I'm, okay, you've set yourself a challenge, off you go. So in some ways it's, it can be a good thing. Like, and, and in the same way that the first play I wrote was about the, a, a box coach. And then after I'd written it and put it on, I then came across this other play about a boxing trainer that, that was just one, one of the favorite ones I've seen and blew made mine look like a four lines squiggled on a page, blew it out of the water, but it, it didn't make me go, oh, there's no point, they're too talented. It did the opposite. I just went, well, we're, we both had the same thought process. This guy delivered 10 times more, so I may up my game. You know what I mean? It, it can be yeah. a bit of both. Like, yeah. Both. Um, and is, have you found the transition from I'll use the word backstage again, not in the derogatory term. Yeah. Have, 
have you found that transition easy enough? Yeah, well, I, I had kind of moved into more the management side of things, as in at there some meetings, and then I was running a couple of venues when I decided I had a punt at doing a master's in creative writing. So that that was interesting when you're meeting people um, on gigs, maybe not just in theater, but like, you know, live events and to suddenly go, what are you doing? Where are you yeah. working now? And I go, uh, I'm, I'm doing a writing course in Queens. And they're kind of looking at you going, you're doing what? Like, um, but I, I happily enough went, right, I'll, I'll let that go. And then I then took a normal job. I took a senior management post in the opera house because it, it was the opera house and it was a, you know, suit and tie, boardroom meetings, doing all that stuff. So the writing kind of slipped a bit, but I kind of thought, well, I was doing it for dough to buy a house and whatever else and going, yeah, yeah. I'm not convinced that, well, I don't, I don't think a lot of playwrights can make money full time on it, but that thing from a bit earlier on where I'm not convinced myself that I necessarily want that to be the way that I make money. I think I could be yeah, helping yeah. out writing when it feels the time to write and doing whatever to earn do and being happy going well if I can get it on at some point um, as opposed to going I have to write this and it has to be a success and it has to make do and attaching my self-worth to the success of a project so yeah it's nice to kind of balance my bit of it um, and I suppose a, a part of me chose that because you can generally only get better do you know what I mean it's not something that well, worst case scenario is you, you're going to stay. You're not going to get worse. Yeah, but it, yeah. So it's kind of going. So, ten or fifteen years down the time down the line, I, it can't be worse than it is now. I'll have learned something, um, and I kind of like that. I like there's no, you know, there's only so long you can be rigging lights and climbing ladders before your body starts to break down. Where yeah, yeah, yeah. with writing, you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I could be. 70 or 80 and get my first hit play and I'm happy with that. It's down yeah. to the range, you know what I mean? There's a, a delay gratification that I quite like. Um, and I, I just recently, I made a wee film last year and I was actually trying to put a play on because of lockdown, I couldn't get a live version. So I was going to try and stream it. Mm -hmm. And then that didn't happen. So I, I kind of accidentally went, right, well, I'll make a film because I'd never looked at that as a, as a format before, but I quite enjoyed the process. Um, right, okay. And I suppose because theatre is so dialogue driven, whereas yeah. medium film is is picture, and it's been kind of nice to kind of look at those things. So, uh, it's uh, I'm quite happy with plodding along. I've been doing quite a bit in in lockdown just because there's nothing else to do. Um, yeah. But again, if if in six or eight months time things come back again, if I end up going to work at whatever for a year or two while I try and get these things put on, then it's it's mm -hmm. fine. I quite like what I do like about the short film thing is at least you've got it. So it's tangible. Yeah. I, you I can, can I write can it go to somebody it. now and go there you go as opposed to going, I had this play on for a week last year and it was really good. Uh, it would have been great if you hadn't been able to see it. Here's yeah. a file block with some words because it means nothing yeah. to anybody, you know. Um, yeah. What would, would you ever do? You, or do you have any intention, or do you think you ever will either direct yourself or write or produce? Is that something that is on your radar? Or I wouldn't. I wouldn't have thought produce. Never say never. But yeah. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have thought produce. I think there's two. For me, there are two types of producers. There's the creative producer and then the the financial producer. Yeah. Um. Yeah, that's a tough gig. That I, yeah, I don't know unless unless I had unless I won the the lottery tonight and I had money. Yeah, I'd, mm, directing. Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd be interested in that. I don't know if it'd be any good, but I'd, I'd be interested. I know or stage or screen or either. Either or, I, I enjoy being with my our people. Yeah, I I love being in a rehearsal room. I love being on set. So. <laughs> And and you pick and you pick and choose. You cherry pick from the the, the people that you like working with. Yeah. So you'd be like, well, I'd, I'd be stealing wee bits of their ideas and stealing. I'm definitely not doing that. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And and like some of the some of the better directors I've worked. That's not obviously the case in all, but some of the better directors are those ones that were actors. Yeah. 
because they have that dialogue with the actor. They know what that process is. However, some of the, you know, the majority of the rest aren't. And what they do is they work visually. Yeah. And, and again, they're not really that interested in my process of how I get to that point. They just want to see that point in, in their picture that they're painting on, on the screen. Yeah. Um, so I'd like to have a go at it. Um, Mickey Jones was a director, actor on Brookside. I met him on uh, Hollyoaks and then we worked together on EastEnders and Emmerdale. Um, he, he got it, but he himself would turn around and go, I don't really know what I'm doing. I, I know what I want. Yeah, yeah. But it's the strength, and then it goes back to Dickie Croxford and, and the casting is, is 80 or 90% of the job. He said, if you have a good crew, yeah, yeah. And what you do is you, you then just have to communicate, which w- was his job as an actor. You just need to communicate to that crew what it is you want. And then he says, and then they work magic. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how to do it, but they do it and they allow me to create the picture that I see in my head. And, and so f- I enjoyed working with Mickey, which is probably why we've ended up working three or four times together. Because yeah. again, shorthand, it was, it was easy. Um, do you so think that would naturally fit with if your degree was visual communications? Yeah, like some of my mates were like, how have you made the jump? And I'm like, it's the same thing. In graphics, I'm selling a product in, in terms of, you know, uh, say package design, uh, washing up liquid. Yeah. The only difference is when I go into a meeting, it's still a sales pitch. I'm just selling me. Yeah, or yeah. my version of the character that they've given me a, 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 a clan brief for. So I, I didn't see it that much of a, I, I also get it where some of my mates who are graphic designers will be like, you'd never catch me ever doing that. Yeah. So I, I get that also, but it, yeah, brand awareness, knowing what you bring into the, the room, I, I, it wasn't that big a leap for me, if I'm honest. So would, if, if you were to give the direct and the go, would you, is new writing something that you're keen on? in terms of stage, or would you rather go, actually, give me give me something that I've seen and I've loved? That's a really good question. Because obviously I know your first question was, what are you reading at the minute? And and I'm like, because I used to be a lazy writer, reader. Um, and it was Harry Potter that got me reading. Right. However, and this is, this is how lazy my mind, my creative mind was. I needed to watch the first film. Yeah, yeah. Steve. And then I could read all the rest of the books. Yeah. And, and whenever they were brought out on that day, I went and bought them and read them because I knew that world. And that's an interesting, because I guess nobody's really pushed me on the directing. I guess with a new piece, it's a clean slate. Yeah. yeah so yeah. I think I would enjoy that. And, and you might argue that that would probably be the way in which I would be given my opportunity. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I think... Do you think I mean, you do you think you'd be more comfortable if it's you and a, a group of actors that, that you trust, given that 70, 30 percent thing you'd maybe go for, exploring a new piece of writing that you're directing because you're on that journey with them as opposed to going, here's the play and here's the notes and the reviews of how it's been done before? Do you know what I mean? Is it uh, but then then I think you see if you were gonna take on a project like that, I wouldn't read the reviews and the notes. Yeah. Because you couldn't, you'd cripple yourself. It's like reading your own reviews. Yeah. I, yeah, that's, that's, that's a tough one. I, I think I'd want to distance myself from that. It's like, I was, I was going to ask you about how you feel whenever, because obviously you, do you, do you speak your words out loud when you're, when you're writing? Uh, I do when I'm rereading them. So, uh, so for instance, I did a, I did a I did a bit last night um, that kind of came out very freely and I've kind of learned not to try and stop and edit as I go. And, and right. through that I go, actually, if I go back and reread this now, while the, the fingers seem to want to be typing, um, I'll mess it up. So I leave it till the next day. Yep. Uh, I'll, I'll read it and I'll go write that on. And then when I read it out, it is it sounds totally different, which is why it's vital to read it out. I mean, because I, I think you can tell the difference between a writer who writes and a writer who reads out. Yeah, yeah. You mean because spoken spoken language and and and, and are written language totally are different. Two very very different things. Yeah. And also as well, there's a when you speak it out. Not that I'm very good at. There's obviously 
there's a tonal thing that happens that w when you're writing it and reading it back in in your head it sounds like one thing and it can be i mean it's, it's the joy of when you hear a, a, an actor first read a part or a script where they they bring something to it that you consciously probably didn't even know was there you know obviously yeah. subconsciously you put it in but they put their spin on it and you're just sitting with your jaw open going holy fuck you know it's I mean, it's, it's something that amazes me about actors has been able to to pick something up and either have read it 10 minutes beforehand or the night beforehand and sit in the room and be able to, to bring so much to it, it it's yeah. phenomenal skill work do you get nervous on a first read through uh yeah but then I've only had a few things on them, and most of them I've either put on myself or I'll have done a reading myself before someone's come in to take on the project. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I get terrified. Um, I also get convinced. I, I tell you how I know if something's good. If I write something that's good, I know it's good because I am convinced that I haven't written it and that I have stolen it from somebody else. In fact, I remember who mentioned Martin Lynch earlier on. I remember uh, texting him one day going, did you have a scene in the play about blah, blah, whatever it was I'd written? And he was like, no. And I'm like, are you sure, Martin? Have I done one of your plays? Because I, I'd written four or five pages and was convinced. I was going, I've heard this. I've been I've been working backstage and this has gone in subconsciously. And I'm now yeah. this thinking that it's mine, but it's not. So when it doesn't feel like yours, it's usually good. <laughs> That's what I find. How, how, how fucked up do we have to be in our heads to, to recognise that and to... to do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's a strange thing. And uh, for me, I mean, I, I can force some writing out, and I know I'm forcing it out, and I know it, it probably won't be that good, but that's okay because it's how you get started and sitting down in a session. Um, but there is times where I will have written something and come down the next day and read three or four pages and literally have no memory of writing it and, and go, right, I've obviously slipped into a zone there and it's written yeah. itself you know um in I, a good way or a bad way or both i think in a good way um okay. and i think so like i was sitting down doing a bit last night and i knew i was trying to force it out hoping that i'm going to get to that point yeah yeah, yeah. itself and I'll, I'll probably do the same this evening um I'll read back over what I've done and either try and do notes or just put up a blank page and see if I can remember what I've written and just try and start it again. And I hope that if you head into that zone, it goes somewhere. Like, um, but I think that's a, that's that element of, of sitting down and physically learning lines. That's the job. When yeah, you're a writer, you write, you do it even even if you don't want to or you don't feel you can. Yeah, you yeah. Just, right. You just sit down and you do the job. I mean, I, I, I suppose that the three best bits for me are reading something back and going, yeah, I've definitely got something here and I, I, I can move this on. That's, that's the first big tech of going, this is great. Hearing the actor read it out loud is, is a massive moment. And then I suppose to an extent when an audience is in, but not, you know, not for them laughing or the applause, but at the end, just because of the dynamic it changes with the performer. And yeah, yeah, that vibe. yeah, and then all, all the rest of the stuff is it's dead on, it's all right. Like, but for me, that's kind of the, the, the three wee points. Um, and two of those have nothing to do with me, you yeah. know. One of them is, 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 is the actor and whoever's directing, and the other is the audience and, and the actor. So, you know, the only thing I the first bit of writing it down is my main bit, and then it's those other two bits, and everything else is is and can be nice but I, I could take her leave like you know yeah but then ultimately if you hadn't done that first part the rest doesn't happen certainly 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 you know I, then, I, I love when uh when you're in a reading and and the actors really get it and then suddenly say something to you and it, it just sparks you off you can go yeah i can i can reword that or that doesn't work or throw it out and and you just rattle it and that's purely down to bouncing off other people um yeah. Well, that's what I come back to in terms. It's, it's for me. It's about collaboration. Yeah. Now I understand that there's an opening night or there's a transmission date, so I know that there's a, a structure. Yeah, yeah. Deadline. You have to get it done by this point. You have to get this bit done by this point, otherwise it doesn't continue on. So I, I get that. But 
I, I enjoy that freedom and that space, that sharing of ideas, that yeah. Yeah, collaboration for me is, is, is probably where I get my most enjoyment from it. Yeah. Um, I did a, speaking of Kieran McElroy, um, he put me in touch. He had done a, a play in a room above a pub, the Red Lion, the old Red Lion, yeah. Angel and, and he'd gone on to do Manny Jones's Stones's Pockets in the West yeah. End. And uh, they'd asked him, could he do it? And he's like, no, I'm in the West End. But there's this, there's this kid, new kid on the block, Glenn, give him a shout. And so Ken McClement, Scottish guy, director, but Seamus Finnegan, a Belfast writer, and, yeah. uh, which, and that was the play, that was the same creative team that Kieran had worked with. Um, Murder at Bridgeport um, was this. It was about the Irish diaspora um, out in America. Yeah. And uh, that was, again, two, two years coming out of college. So this was the first time I was in a rehearsal room with not only the director, but the actual writer of the piece. You know, he wasn't dead. Yeah. This, yeah, yeah. this writer was here and was interested in, in feedback. Um, yeah. And that was a massive, that was a, what we call a profit share. Yeah. And I think after the four week rehearsal, four week run, I think I made 70 quid. And so I learned not to do profit shares with more than two people. Yeah, yeah. Um, but Seamus, I went up to Seamus. He was cool as fuck, Seamus. Um, he smoked uh, jetans. Back in the days, I don't smoke, but back in the days where you could in a rehearsal room, you know? Yeah. You know, he, he, was, he was just fucking cool. And I've gone up to him, I've gone, Seamus, see this line? I'm just, I'm having real difficulties, mate. I just, you know. Change it, son. <laughs> and I'm like, can I? Aye. It's work in progress, go on. I'm like, all right. So I'm for the next fucking week and a half, two weeks, I'm changing this line every fucking day. Do you know what I mean? I'm still uh, working, I'm still working it. Aye, son. And then, of course, it came to like, you know, two days before we open or whatever. And I've gone up, I've gone, Seamus, see that, see that line, see that line. He's gone, huh? I'm going to go back to there. I'm going to go back to your line. He went, I knew you would, son. <laughs> and I was like, hi. And so not only was he cool, then he was fucking super cool. Yeah, yeah. Because he didn't let his ego get in the way. Yeah. He let the eager whippersnapper kid go yeah, off and do his own wee thing. Because if he'd have turned around and gone, that's the line. Yeah. That's what I've written. That's what you say. But he was interested in collaboration. There was no ego involved. And then he came back and went, it's fine, it's good. Burn. And you're like, right, okay. And so that's what I mean. Every job you do, there's always there's always well, a lesson. Yeah. yeah. Glenn, I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of time. Um, thank you very much. No, no bother at all. Great to see your face, mate. You too, man. You too, man. I'm just going to uh, 